All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here and giving us a little bit of your time for this wonderful presentation that Gordon Goodwin is going to do for us. This is a webinar series that we're doing at Make Music. And uh, today it's on Dolphin Street, a big band, chart, big band chart anatomy with Gordon Goodwin. So my name is Giovanna Cruz and my colleague Lee Calistad here is going to do the introductions. We'll just do really brief introductions about ourselves. Uh, Giovanna is a cellist and uh, was the orchestra director in the Austin Public Schools for six years. And she was doing so much great work with the New Smart Music and the Finale program with her students that Make Music hired her right out of the, uh, the classroom. Uh, I was also hired out of the classroom in 2003. My background is concert band, jazz band, and choirs. And uh, of course, I was using Finale um, and Smart Music with my students as well. Together, we're the Make Music Education team, and we create all the clinics and materials and training events uh, throughout the year. And one of the things that's been really wonderful is to do this series of webinars where we feature great guests. And we're so excited today to have Gordon Goodwin. I'm sure that you tune in because you know something about Gordon. Uh, just a couple highlights I'll mention. Of course, his website we have on screen. He's got a lot of different links there for content and events and schedules. But then on this next page, you can see uh, just a little bit of his bio. Just a couple highlights. He's 21 Grammy nominations, three Emmys, writes and composes for the Big Fat Band, leads them, books them, I'm sure gets them on stage on time and so on. Radio show host with the Fat Tracks and partnerships with all these great jazz artists. So since everybody in this room today is, is probably has an education connection, Gordon, when you kick us off here, could you maybe just do a little bit of a, a tie-in from your early days? I think you, you started out like in fourth grade as a piano student and then added the instruments. Connect the dots from where you started to how, how you're doing today. And uh, here we go with Gordon Goodwin. <laughs> okay. Well, well uh, that, could, that could take the whole hour to talk about that journey. Uh, but I started piano lessons as a kindergarten kid. Didn't want to do it. Mom and dad made me, but I... You know, did what mom and dad said, and, but I had a piano teacher that um, um, saw that uh, I like to sit and maybe experiment with the piano. Just and so she said to me, if you if you write an, like a little piece, no, what she said was if you practice your scales, I'll let you compose a piece. That's what it was, right? So I said, compose. What does that even mean? She goes, make up a song. I said, well, I don't know. How do you do that? She goes, just sit and find it on the piano. And and I don't know how she intuited that I could do it, but um, I went home and I made up a little stupid thing. I was maybe four years old or five years old, and it was probably a terrible, it wasn't anything, it wasn't Mozart by any means, but she said, great, now next week I want you to write a, a different kind of song, right? Uh, march. So I kind of knew what a march sounded like, so I went home and it was like four bars or eight bars. Next week she said, okay, write a polka. And then I go, what's a polka? You know, so she kind of told me that. Next week, write a waltz. So she kind of had me do that every week. So really early, she planted in my head that I might be able to create my own music as opposed to, you know, just interpreting other people's music. So, uh, but it really wasn't defining for me, just a distraction. Until fourth grade, I started to play the clarinet. And eighth grade, when I started to play the saxophone, and then I had a band director who said, you know, you need to check out this Count Basie thing. Check, go listen to Count Basie. And he played me a Count Basie record, which changed my life. I mean, I had this incredible epiphany at that point that this is what this is home for me. I don't know how I knew it. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know if I was going to write that music or play that music or what was going to happen. But that band director, his name Robin Snyder, he said, you need to write a piece of music like this and we'll play it in the band. So... I was pretty apprehensive about it, you know, when you're at that age, you kind of want to blend in with, the, with your peers and not stick out. So I was pretty nerve wracking, but I wrote something and I wrote something that I thought they would like to play. You know, a little bit catchy, even though I don't even think I knew it was catchy. At the time, I just was trying to come up with something. They liked it, played it at the spring concert, recorded it on our little, you know, record we made. And... Um, that ties into our presentation today in an interesting way, because early on, I had the idea that if, if the musicians like what I do, they're going to want to play it. And they're not going to make fun of me for, for you know, 
receiving to write something for them, for um, having the temerity to put a piece of music on the stand. Um, that's something that still kind of happens for me when I'm writing music. And now for the big fat band, I, I, I know who the guys are. I know what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. And I, I write to that. Sometimes I can even push them a little bit in certain areas. But sometimes, you know, I get grief from them even today, you know, about, about some of the things that I bring in. So um, knowing the final destination for the music became something I became aware of pretty early. And so what I wanted to do today was talk about uh, a trip that I wrote. And uh, despite my best intentions for where I thought it was going to end up, stuff happened. Music business happened. Life happened. And I had to reinvent it as we went. Um, which presented some interesting challenges. So, Giovanni, if you want to go to uh, the screen that talks about Zenf Studios, Z-E-N-P-H. So this is a company that I got a relationship with, and I, I became uh, on their advisory board. It was me and Quincy Jones and Branford Marsala, so I was pretty happy to be there with those guys. And what this company does, and I, I'm going to get in over my head quick to try to explain it, but... They have software, and this software can interpret audio data and clean it up, like especially if it's an old audio recording, it's got a lot of, you know, hisses and, you know, bumps and distortion and, and weird audio artifacts. It can clean all that stuff up. So then you end up, and then it converts that, that data into some other form. It's kind of like MIDI, but it's better than MIDI. It's more sophisticated. And what these guys did, they took a, an old recording of Glenn Gould, the classical pianist, playing his box stuff, and they cleaned it up. And then they put this data into a Yamaha Disclavier Pro, which is one of those player piano deals. You're like, that they had that piano re-perform the Glenn Gould performance, and they recorded it. And the amount of realism that they had achieved with that was just remarkable. It sounded like Glenn Gould, but it sounded like a contemporary version of it. So that was their first project. Their second project was this guy, Art Tatum. And they got, a record, they got a recording that Tatum made here in Los Angeles in 1939 at the Shrine Auditorium. Pretty legendary piece of music history. But it sounds like it's recorded in 1939. A lot of, a lot of uh, weird, you know, artifacts, an attitude, piano, stuff like that. Now, if he's Art Tatum, so you, as you hear that, you kind of listen past that stuff. But these guys thought, what if we could take this recording and make it sound like a new recording? So they did. They rented the shrine. They put the Yamaha Disco Vera right center stage, put a bunch of about 25 mics around it, and re-performed all the Tatum songs. So it was he had the same sound of the room, you know, as in 1939, which helped a lot. But this time, it's recorded in 96K, you know, surround sound. I mean, it sounds like a million bucks. And I'm standing there. I was like the host of, the, of this evening. And I'm watching the piano, and I'm just watching Tatum do what he did, which is you know, an incredible thing. Art Tatum, he, was, uh, he learned how to play the piano because he was blind, so he would go to the dime store, and they had a, like a piano roll there, and he would listen to it. And he'd go, yeah, I, I think I, I want to do that. So he would go home and try to replicate what he heard. But what he didn't know is that piano rolls were typically recorded with four hands. And he went to his house and just did it with two, which explained his prodigious technique. So anyway, I did. I, they gave me the Art Tatum track. We picked out one of them, and I wrote an arrangement based on his solo. We recorded it, had a lot of success with it. We played it at the Hollywood Bowl with the piano, like doing Art Tatum's thing, and the band with headphones kind of staying in sync with him. It was great, really great experience. So next up, Zemphs comes to me, and they say, now we want to do another record. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see a photo of Oscar Peterson. So they get a bunch of Oscar Peterson solos from back in the day. And they said, Gordon, why don't we do the same thing with Oscar? And I'm like, well, way into it. I love Oscar. So we're listening through all the catalog and trying to see which one would be, be a good solo to take and blow it up and have it be you know, with the big fat band. And there was one thing that caught my, my ear and my eye, which was a TV show that Oscar used to host in Canada. It was a pretty incredible thing. He only did like nine of them. But in those nine episodes, he would get other musicians like Dizzy Gillespie and Count Basie and um, guys like that. And he would interview them and play music with them in this TV show. And the thing is, 
like only about 10 people saw it. It just aired one time in Canada back in the 60s, right? So at the beginning of this show, he played this song with his trio of Bobby Durham on drums and Ray Brown on the bass. And I got this video of him playing on Green Dolphin Street as the opener of his show. And I've got the video, and why don't we take a look at that right now? shows up tonight and our guest tonight is really exciting a pianist whom I love and adore and I'm sure you will also Mr. Jimmy Rolls with us along with Ray Brown and Bobby Durham who are going to join me now to do this for Oscar. Are you guys clapping? Everybody that's still there? Yeah, we're still here. Okay, so there it is. So what Zemp did was they took that video, the crappy sounding audio from that video, and they took, and they were able to isolate and get rid of Ray Brown on the bass and get rid of Bobby on the drums. Now, all they had was just Oscar's piano information. Put it in the software, we got to kind of clean it up. They have to kind of do some interpretive things. And they're, they're musicians, too, at this at this company. So they kind of know how to deal with things like pedal, sustain pedal information, and touch and release information on, on the keyboards. A lot of subtle things that they do to make it sound authentic. So they give it to me. And then I then have to write my arrangement. So the first thing I realized that I need to do is I need to do, build look, a tempo map. Because Oscar and Ray and Bobby are just playing. So as they play, you can see, here's my uh, conduct the conductor track. You can see that at the beginning, they're about 252 beats a minute. By bar seven, they've gone a little faster. Then they drop back down at bar 14 to 252. So you can see the tempo kind of ebbs and flows, which is kind of a natural thing for playing music that needs to breathe like jazz does. Interestingly, I, I noticed that as they played this song, and if you know the song, you'll know the part that goes da 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 da. And then back to the A section. Every time their tempo just got a little bit faster as the chords moved up in that progression, which is maybe a natural human thing to do, which is cool. So I built this because I knew I had to have the big fat band be able to play with those guys 
and and also follow those tempo changes as they happen, right? Fortunately, I've got a band full of studio musicians that know how to follow the click track and still play with a good feel. So that was the first thing. Um, the other thing was I, I I knew I didn't want to have, I didn't need that beginning where Oscar's talking. Right? We don't need that. I also thought it's a little bit sh short. So what I decided to do, and what I, I didn't want to change anything about Oscar. I didn't want to touch a thing. It needed to be, have the kind of integrity and respect for what he played. But what I did on his arrangement, when he goes to the shout, kind of shout course, where he's playing the melody with full hands, I cut that and I moved that over and inserted a couple of choruses for our trumpet soloist, Bob Summers. I knew he didn't have a solo on this record yet that we were doing. Perfect solo for him, perfect song for him. And then it kind of stretches the song, gives a little more weight. So I put that in. I also put in a, a little saxophone solo and a little bit of an ensemble thing. And then worked my way back to where Oscar joins us again. And here you see the score, the intro to the song. Now, this is, you can see the bass line in the left hand of the piano. That's where Oscar's playing, just vamping on that as he introduces the show. So, um, because I know this is a noty solo with a lot of activity, I decide maybe we start this arrangement with a little more, um, you know, legato flavor. So, I wrote this, this kind of a horn line. Really, it's like sustained kind of effects. Uh, you can see that the, there's flute, soprano sax, the trumpets, you, it, you, they're not indicated here, but they're in mutes and harmony mutes and cut mutes. So have a softer texture to contrast with all the bombacity that's going to become. So, uh, Giovanna, you can play. The, well, this, we're going to hear the horn. <laughs> now, the key is E flat minor, but... That's pretty ambiguous harmonically there. The reason it is, there's no there's no E flat concert in those voicings. It's all left for the bass, which is going do 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 do. Go to the next page, and here here's the full mix with the rhythm section and the horns. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Now on the next page, I decided to repeat that section but add a quick counter melody, just to hint at a little more, um, little more act, uh, activity. You can see it's two trumpets, both Harmon and cut mute, flute and soprano sax. And, of, and uh, I might've played that on the piano too. It sounds like this, here's the horn part. And you can hear the trombones adding a little bit of an answer in, in, with their cut mutes. Let's go to the next next page and play that phrase with the rhythm section too. It sounds like I also overdubbed the piano in octaves. You can kind of hear a little bit of a point. Ding, 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 ding. It's kind of an interesting thing to do to add just a bit of an uh, interest on the attack you know, for, for phrases like that. Okay, now we get to the first chorus and I think I drop everybody out for the, for the, uh, the first uh, eight bars of that. What we're seeing now is the second eight of the phrase where the horns join him and he goes and the, the band goes with him and then the saxes have a counter melody. You can see that in bar 39. The counter melody is a little bit odd rhythmically, but I had to have this, them line up with the rhythms that Oscar was playing. Let's listen to the horns first. Okay, with that in mind, let's, let's go to the next page and listen to that with the rhythm section as well. So that is Oscar's arrangement. Do, ding, bom, bing, bom, bom. It's an interesting rhythmic permutation of the melody, which he which he did all the time when he would do arrangements of songs. He just he very rarely would just sit and kind of just play the melody ad hoc. He'd find some angle, you know, to make it interesting. And and I was thinking as, as a listener, this would be the first time that you would kind of get the idea that wait a minute, that 
piano is playing with the band, and it's kind of a kind of a, a hybrid of a solo and and and, uh, and an orchestration. Let's go to the next page. This is the end of the first chorus, going into where he starts to improvise. And uh, it's really the first place that we really play exactly with him, because he ends his solo, boop up, ba dee up, bump, and then does his solo break. And so the whole the horns play that with him like this. And the trombones give that little declarative bump downbeat. Let's hear it with the uh, with the rhythm. Yeah. Now, bar 61, it was a problem for me because look at the chord symbol, everybody. The chord symbol, if you can see it, is F minor 7. And if you look at the trumpets and you look at the saxophones, you can see that Oscar plays an A natural on that bar. So the, the F minor 7 with the minor 3rd, well, he plays a major 3rd. Now, I don't know about you. But if I want to pick one note that I can't justify with an with F minor 7, it's a major third. I can justify almost any other note on that downbeat. Oscar's bigger than life. And he just sits on it. So I'm thinking, OK, sometimes uh, certain textures like a piano or even a vocal can coexist with that kind of clash in a, in a way that I don't quite understand. But I know this with horns. It's just there. It's declarative. It's just there's something about it that seems to be more insistent and noticeable. So I'm thinking, and I tried it a couple different ways. I tried making it an A flat, so it would just be an F minor seven. It would work, and it just there was something. I I grew to um, I grew to love that weird A natural. The more I heard it, the and the more I realized that my goal here is to respect Oscar. He played it. It's not my place to decide that it was wrong or, or wrong. I, we're going with it. Here's what it sounds like with just the horns, with that A natural. Oh, yeah, then the, yeah, there's a few other things. But that um, is a, an answer to something Oscar played. And then, uh, then the horns are starting to kind of get more active and just those the trombones go bop and the trumpets bop. Let's let's go to the next page and hear that with the with the whole with the whole band. Hey, can you play that one more time? Let's hear that one more time. Listen for that A natural. I'm so used to it now. It doesn't sound wrong to me anymore. But boy, did I! But I agonized over that over that choice when I was putting this together. Uh, let's go to the next slide. All right, this lick he plays uh, is really cool. Starting in bar uh, seventy-three, and I thought, oh, I, I want to get a piece of that with the band. But I realized that if I doubled it exactly, it would be overwhelming too much maybe so i ended up deciding to split it up you can see in bar 73 the saxes go da 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 da, da. the trumpets answer but didn't do that and then the saxes pick up didn't didn't da, and then uh do da 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 let's listen to it with just the horns one more time can we play it one more time please You can really hear the, the big fat band trumpet section's commitment to playing good time because one of the hardest things to do, like in bar 73, is to come in on the end of three of that bar and not be late because basically it's a handoff from the saxes. Double, double, da, ba, double, double, da. And it's kind of in a lower register for them, too. It's a little harder for it to speak and to, and to have the kind of impact. So um, uh, that's a kind of impressive thing. Let's go on to the next page and hear that with the uh, rhythm section. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah. I love that part. Uh, another cool Oscar lick that I decided to, to uh, double with the saxophones. And uh, the tricky thing about this one was, look at bar the first bar, 93. You've got a quarter note in the sax is tied to an eighth note triplet. It's, it was really hard to not be late on that second beat on the second note of the triplet. And then in bar 95, you can see that it's notated eighth note with two sixteenths. So, 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 and I listened to this again and again to try to hear what Oscar played. And he definitely played a little more even on bar 93 than he did on 95. Here's here's what the horns sound like playing that lick. Let's hear that on the next slide with the rhythm section too. Yeah. All right, uh, I like this part of what Oscar do, does here too. He, after all the jazz and the syncopation in this, he plays this straight up and down bop, 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 bop in bars uh, 109, 110, 111. And um, I decided to answer his quarter notes with quarter notes of my own. And, uh, and, and it wasn't until I heard it and realized, yeah, that's actually kind of work. I was a little worried that it was gonna be a little bit too up and down and, you know, and rigid. But I thought it came out cool. Here, uh, let's listen to this with the horns only. Um, you can see uh, the same thing happens in bar 107, 108, where the saxes go da ba da ba da ba da 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 and the trumpets pick that up. So that's a kind of a, a device I like to use a lot to toss the point of interest around the band. Um, so. And it takes a real awareness if you're playing in a band and you, is, is your part the focus? It might be the focus for those four notes and maybe not for the next four notes. So it really becomes a, a matter of not having tunnel vision where you're just playing your part, but you have a real awareness of what everybody in the band is doing. Let's go to the next uh, slide and hear that with, uh, with the rhythm section. <laughs> Okay, now, uh, uh, next section is the part that we added to this, to Oscar's performance. So um, this is just a fat band for a while, and it's a little send off into the trumpet solo. Um, check out, uh, uh, we'll play these eight bars, and then you can hear that big uh, shake that happens in bar 124 and the uh, badassery of Wayne Bergeron and those guys and how they just dig into that thing. Check it out. That's, a, that's kind of tough to do because it's not a long time to hold that note. You're not going da 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 bye It's ba ba da ba da da bye You know, uh, excuse me, I'm not shaking very well today. Um, so, um, other thing I would point out to you guys is that, uh, and I, I want to play this again, bar 121, you can see the trumpets one and two are up above the staff. Trumpets three and four are an octave below, doubled by trombones one and two. So that's a high B for the first and second trombones, a little bit of a risk. Pick that up, pop, pick it out of the blue like that. And then trombones three and four are an octave below, below that, right? So it's three octaves. And normally for brass unisons, I tend to want to write two octaves. It tends to be a little more mobile. It tends to get a little weighty with three. But in this case, I, no way did I want to put four trombones up on that high B. Uh, and I thought it was a short enough lick and it would work. So let's listen to this one more time with just the horns and check out that three octave unison. <laughs> Now, it helps me that I have guys in the band that are really committed to playing good time, good forward moving time. So they're they're not gonna they're not gonna be 
da 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 and be all behind the beat, which will tend to slow everything down. They're they're uh, they're very really committed to that. Let's listen to the next page with uh, this this uh, this lick with the rhythm section. <laughs> Okay, moving on. The next slide. Uh, our trumpet soloist Bob plays for a while, and then we get back to the A section, and um, the, the ensemble plays this uh, this figure. I want you to guys to look um, for those of you interested in the voicing here. The bass trombone is pretty high in the staff. He's playing the third. Da 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 da. da. The baritone sax is a third below that. He's playing like an E flat, but I, I don't have anybody down in the low register where the bass is below the staff. Um, in this case, I think because it really gives a, a, a um, makes it a lot more mobile, opens up the low end and and uh, well, check it out for yourself. Here's the horns playing this lick at 133. That's some tight business. Look, he's heard again. And notice something else that they're doing. It's not notated. You notice how they're accenting, but it bop, 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 they're accenting downbeats. So it's written, da -da 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 -da, but, but Wayne and the guys knew that there's a way to bring up some nuance and musicality sometimes, you know, to, to and I'm pretty, I'm pretty finicky about notating phrasing, but I, I rarely leave a note, uh, un, you know, without unmarked. But in this case, that was a good idea. Let's listen to that one more time. And you can hear they're putting a scoop, just a little scoop on the end of four of, of uh, 134. Also, not notated, but it seemed appropriate. Let's go to the next page and listen to that with the whole, with the rhythm. And then the next thing after that, in bar 136, the trombones do this, right? And um, I, I just love how they articulate this. It's just so tight and so so together. Can we hear that here, please? Now, trombones, trumpets can get away with that kind of fast articulation. If I would have written that for the saxes, we would have been in trouble, right? I mean, if I would have had to play it, we would have been in trouble. Eric and those guys could probably, you know. But it wouldn't sound as effortless. Let's hear that again. That just sounds like falling off a log, right? No problem for them. For that, for that section, it works. Let's go to the next, the next uh, page. All right, this is a saxophone solely. And um, uh, we could get into the, to the uh, nuance of the voicings, I, I guess. I, uh, it's a, I use a combination of techniques. I, I use a lot of drop two voicings, uh, if you know what that means. But um, one thing that's interesting in this, and I don't think we're going to hear it in this first example, but you can look at the, I've split out the score, you see alto one, alto two, tenor one, tenor two, baritone, and then you see the guitar, and he's playing the melody with the lead alto the whole way. That is a really cool thing to try once in a while, if you've got the guitar player that can phrase with the saxes, with the saxes, accent with them, and, uh, you know, have have his note length be, uh, have the same kind of integrity. Let's hear it first, I don't think you'll hear the guitar in this version. <laughs> One more time, hear that again. They they take a breath at the beginning and then they take another breath at the down beat of 161 and that's it. You can hear in this mix the, the lead alto, Eric Marienthal is a little louder than everybody else, right? Which is something I like to do. I think the melody deserves like a, just a little push when you're mixing, uh, mixing the big band. Can you get that one more time, please? Let's go on the next slide and hear it with the rhythm section and listen for the sound of the guitar with the saxophones. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Now the guitar there. Let's go to the next. Let's go to the next. The next page. 
Now, this is uh, the A section of the song. Going in, uh, we're about to take this chart uh, to the finish line. Uh, you see that the melody starting, it goes do da 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 crescendoing, and then boom, ba, 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 ba. Now, look at the bar 172. And you can see uh, Wayne, the first trumpet, has a high F with a big old lip trill. Um, this started off with everybody having a lip trill on the third beat, because you can see everybody else in the brass, they go bomb, 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 where Wayne goes bomb, bomb, ba. And when we rehearsed it, Wayne said, hey, you know what? It sounds kind of weird for me to start the lip trill on beat one and then the guys to join me on beat three. And I, I wouldn't have guessed that that would be the case, but he was right. So I said, let's have everybody just play straight and let Wayne only do the lip trill. And what that ended up doing, it put a great focus on what he does. Listen to this. Here's the horns only. You kidding me? Right? <laughs> Can we hear that one more time? I mean, it's one of the most amazing sounds in big bands, right? To have a moment like that. You got a boss of a lead trumpet player who's just, you know, nailing it like that. Um, you can also hear, I think, that Wayne, once again, mixed a little bit louder than the rest of the horns. Now, let me tell you something about recording with that guy. His sound is so huge that it's everywhere in the room. It's in everybody's microphones, you know? And so you you get a little bit of that even naturally when you record it with the big band with him. But when I mix him, and what we used to do, like we'll have mics on each instrument, then we'll have a couple of room mics to capture the room sound. And I'm always pushing his his uh, individual mic a little bit, you know, just because I, I love to hear the melody, but I also love to hear the personality of these lead players to, in, to inform how the ensemble sounds. Let's go to the next, uh, next page and hear that part with the rhythm section. <laughs> That's so that's so cool. It it also obscures the kind of cool counter melody that the saxes are playing. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -da. Can we hear it one more time and try to pick that pick that counter melody out in bar 171 and 172? Yeah, there's no way there's no way to hear that hear the sax line very well. Guitar plays it with them. You can see the guitars playing that line with the saxes, but with the with the brass playing those powerful chords and they're crescendoing to fortissimo. Ah, forget it. That's what that's pretty much what you're gonna get. Let's go to the next page. Trombone soli, and you want to check it. I wrote the first trombone in treble clef because he's got a high D in the in bar 175. I knew Andy Martin could play high Ds all day, and it's really uh, uh, not something I would do very often, but I did it here. Here's what it sounds like. Right? Sounds good. Next page. Doesn't sound that high. I'm, really, when you think about it, sounds like every trombone player should play a high D, I think. Move on. Next page, please. Okay. Here's the end of this chart. Now, if you remember, Oscar in the video we watched. So he goes, um, do da da da, and he played this A flat minor and he kind of tremoloed and did some things and then just hit the last note. <laughs> right? So I thought, I got a big band on my hands here. I want them to make a contribution to the end of this song over what he did. So I wrote this ascending line in bar uh, 2, 218. With a big last chord, and that boy, the, the, that chord is uh, very, very resonant. The way it's voiced, um, it's a pretty large spread with a lot of, uh, like you look at the trombones. Okay, first the the bass trombone's got a G again. Then third's got a, a up a fourth to a C, up another fourth 
to an F for second trombone, and then up a third. So you've got these quartal relationships, which add a real hipness, I think, to the voicing somehow, as opposed to just always stacking in thirds. Um, let's listen to this without, without the rhythm. Let's hear that once again. I want you guys to listen to the musicians as they crescendo and decrescendo exactly at the same time. One more time. There's something that happens in a chord like that as they crescendo, and I don't know how to mark this i wish i did there's a warmth or a vibration that happens with with a ensemble when it plays a, a, a chord that's voiced well and that that they just sink into ah, it's kind of a i don't know it's a it's a emotional commitment or something that happens you know um love hearing that let's go to the next bar the next page and hear this ending with the rhythm section <laughs> So we got our chart, we recorded it, we got it. Let's go to the next page and let me tell you what happened after this part. So this is the process that I went through. So it took me about two days to sort through all the videos and CDs, finding the right track to do. Then I had to transcribe his solo, write it out, build that click track so we could match his tempo. It took a couple days for that. Then I go into Digital Performer, which is a composing program I use, and I kind of put the chart together, sketch it, it took a day. Then I got to orchestrate it. I do that in finale. That took about two days. Next slide. So then at the same time, Zemp is preparing Oscar's audio, you know, and they're tweaking it and they're doing their things that they do. Took them at least a couple weeks to do that. We go in the studio, record the chart, playing along with Oscar's audio. That took a half a day, maybe about three hours for us to do that. We mixed it, took a probably better part of a day to mix it. And then we mastered it, which is the final step in, in recording music where the mastering engineer, I don't even know what he does. Just it's like a final sprinkling of, you know, fairy dust that makes it just kind of have, have some um, uh, more audio integrity. It's incredible, the difference. So I'm thinking this is going to be great. And Zemp had already talked to Oscar Peterson's estate, you know. They're all, they love it. They love the idea, you know, and they're all cool. And then they got new lawyers. And these new lawyers decided that it ain't so cool. We had done all that work, and these guys say, maybe, maybe we don't want Oscar to play with a big band. He never played with a big band, did he? No. And, and so I'm looking at having probably spent about $10,000, that much money, on this piece of music, and I can't use it. I, I had a, an hour-long phone call with, with Oscar's widow, and I'm trying to, I'm doing everything I can to try to charm her into you know, understanding that, that we have the greatest respect and, and affection for Oscar. And furthermore, when I go to sc high schools and colleges and stuff, all the kids know Herbie, you know, and they know Chick. They don't know Oscar. And that's, something's wrong with that. And I said to his widow, I said, I think we can help with that. I think if kids hear this track on our record, then they go out and discover Oscar and the incredible thing, and we can help with his legacy. And, and you know, I talked for an hour and she just wasn't buying it. I sent her the track. I said, what do you think of the track? She goes, oh, it's pretty good, pretty good. She wasn't, wasn't persuaded. So I'm thinking, well, I have this track, calls all that money and I can't release it. Even though my attorney told me, really, you could release it because this is not the Oscar Peterson recording. This is a new recording. You took that information and you replayed it on a piano. On a, on a Yamaha's disc levere, legally speaking, it's a new master. They have nothing to do with it. But I couldn't go there. I just, I just felt that it was like unethical, you know, to use his track without their permission. So we released the record without it. You know, if I just pull it. So we decided, okay, no, you know, we're just gonna. I just will. I don't know what we'll do. So this track is sitting in my iTunes folder, just 
for six months just mocking me. You know, I'm thinking, is this really where it's going to end up? I spent all that good intention and all that great energy, and now it's just dead. So I made a few calls to some people to ask if maybe get someone else to come play it. Uh, nobody was available. So finally, I decided it was time for me to man up and get on the piano and play the solo. Now, I knew that I was in for it, you know, because things that Oscar can do with one hand, I needed two hands. But I decided, to, okay, I'm going to make this my goal. I would get up every morning for 20 minutes every day, just practice the solo, do it nice and slow, work it up like we do, right, and get to the point where I could maybe go in and actually play this piano solo. Um, what I realized, though, is that, you know, since this is no longer Oscar's solo, it's me kind of interpreting Oscar's solo, I can maybe put a little of my stuff in there along with Oscar's stuff. And that's what I did. I played the Oscar licks that go with the orchestrations, you know, with the things we just discussed, and I and that I put some of my own stuff in because it became kind of a hybrid of Oscar improvised solo, Gordon solo, the, the arrangement, the, the guy's performance. And um, to me, it kind of represents um, a new, um, kind of a new way of music, making music. We, we're starting to see all over the place with people like Jacob Collier, you know, who's just playing all the instruments and shooting the video. And uh, and it is, it, it's the, the whole art form is changing. And I think that we're watching our industry struggle to be able to, to adapt to those changes. Um, but that's that's another that's another seminar. So um, when it came to uh, Alfred Publishing and what we do with this chart, they they wanted to publish it, but their concern was how many high school bands have a piano player that can play it. So what we decided to do, we go to the next screen. We we ended up having um, well here's the here's the uh, piano solo music. So we published it for solo piano, but we also published it for all the instruments. I wrote out a solo version of the for trumpet, for alto, for tenor, for trombone, and so that really any any instrument in the band could play this solo along with the arrangement. So that was kind of a a, a gesture to try to make you know, lemonade out of these lemons, you know, to find a way. Maybe it could be a better thing. Maybe it could be something that could be useful, you know, for for, uh, for all the instruments. Um, so uh, for me, in the end, you know. I, I, I'm so grateful that I got a chance to, to work with, with, with and be a small part of the legacy of Oscar Peterson. And uh, I don't blame Kelly Peterson for what for her decision. You know, she's got his legacy. So they have like an advisory board that they, that they talk about, well, okay, what are we going to do? What's the best thing to do to protect Oscar's legacy? And, and I, you have to respect that. Um, this, I have to say that when, when this arrangement won a Grammy Award, I was felt a little you know, vindicated a little bit. Um, I didn't, I, I, once again, though, I don't use that as a, uh, any kind of a, I told you so to anybody. For me, it's just great. You know, it's been a great learning experience you know, to do this. And it taught me more and more that I have to remember to be flexible because after the composer does his job, it's not always done. You put it in front of the band and, and, and your lead trumpet might say, why don't we do this? This might work better. And I think you need to be open to that stuff. I think the same, same way should work for any level high school, college, I think that it's important to get the people, the kids in the band to be invested in the creation of the music. So you're not just telling them do this and do this and do this, or the, the chart isn't telling them to do this and do this and do that, that they can be invested in and in a participant in, in how that goes. So uh, that's what I got. Uh, we have a little time left uh, if we have any questions for uh, if anything we talked about. So it looks here like, well, first of all, I was Phenomenal. That was really exciting and interesting. Thank you. The, um, yeah, so if, if you have a question, please chat that in to Lee Callister down the bottom of the screen. We did have a question come in from Drew early on is, uh, what Basie album got you started? Oh, yeah, yeah. That was um, a record called um, Basie Straight Ahead with uh, arrangements by Sammy Nestico. And the, and for some reason, my band director went to side two, flipped it over to side two, and put the last song, which is called The Queen Bee. Everyone knows that chart, probably. That changed my life. And um, one of my great satisfactions uh, of my career is that, you know, I could call Sammy Esco right now. I, I'm friends with him. I've been able to tell him probably 10 times 
what an inspiration and how much I could never pay him back for what he did for me. And uh, he's the sweetest man ever. You can't even imagine what a, what a great guy he is. Uh, I, I hear that record today and I'm, I'm back in my middle school band room. I can just feel it, you know, what it was like, you know, to hear that music and have my life altered. And I should say, you know, I've, I've directed uh, jazz bands for most of my career, public school groups, high school groups. And so I'm, I'm listening to all this great stuff. I'm listening to what you did. And my first thought was, rats, I don't you know, have a Wayne Bergeron or any of those guys that could play it. And then I realized, well, wait a minute, the concepts you're talking about could be done with any group. You know, what was intended, what was written, how do you play together? Uh, and then, of course, I just uh, want to throw a little bit of a, a plug in for Smart Music there that 63 of your charts are in Smart Music with your group playing. So there is this reference where, where people can, you know, they can have the style, they can have the, the tracks laid down, and they can kind of back off to their practice and things like that. And we should also, also mention that we shot some videos, which are being edited, I believe right now, by Smart Music, of Wayne Bergeron and Andy Martin and Sal Lozano and Eric Marienthal and, and Ray Brink and Kevin Axe and all the guys in the band talking about these arrangements and giving tips. So if, you, if you're playing one of the big fat band charts on smart music, you would have a chance to click on an icon and go watch a quick video talking about the exact chart that you're playing. So I, I think that's, that's really important to be able to you know, pass that, that information yeah, very on good. that way. We got a couple more questions that came in. Uh, one says, hi, did Gordon specify whether the BPB recording of this is him playing Oscar's transcription, or is it literally Oscar in the track with them? Yeah, I, I, I apologize because that was a little ambiguous the way it laid out today. That's me because I, I was legally unable to use Oscar. I've got that mix. I wish you could hear it. I wish you could hear it. It's so great. But, but, but I, I tell you guys, I played that stuff. I didn't, I didn't, I mean, I punched in a couple times, but I didn't use any Pro Tools to edit it because I really said, I have to be able to do this, you know. And uh, yeah, that's me on the, uh, on the record. Very cool. That ties into another question from Drew. Was GDS recorded live in the studio or was it layered? Live. For the rhythm section, we were at Capitol Records. We did the rhythm section and the horns with that click track that I made. Okay. Um, here's a question from the UK. Uh, when is Gordon coming back to the UK to play? We are desperate to see the Fat Band play live. Oh, yeah. We, we were there last, earlier this year and uh, had, a, had a couple of great concerts in Manchester. And um, uh, I, I, we don't have anything yet, but I have to tell you, I just was talking to uh, the uh, guy that books Ronnie Scotts, and uh, we're talking about trying to put something together for next next summer. So hopefully, hopefully we get back there. Uh, it took us long enough to get there in the first place, so uh, definitely want to come back. Uh, here's another question that came in. In terms of voicing large, vibrant chords throughout a big band situation, how do you go about voicing large chords throughout the whole band while still maintaining clarity of harmony uh that's a that's a good question because it really depends on the style um because if you're if it's a more contemporary style of music than this was sometimes those um upper partials don't belong and so if i if it was if and, and matter of fact i don't know i'm thinking about the last chord of what we just heard and I had the trumpets on an f triad which represents of that e flat major seven that represents the ninth and the 13th and the flat five. So you got a big flat five presence in there. And yet I've got the baritone sax on the root. If I had a piano, I could play this stuff for you too. And the second tenor on the fifth, but the fifth and the flat five don't always coexist, except for if the fifth is down in the low register, it kind of grounds it in some fundamental way, you know? And then that flat five can kind of grind, but from, you know, three octaves up. So um, that assessment, is something that uh, you know there's plenty of books that will show you this voicing works this voicing works and some people like to have a little more grind in their voicings than others i tend to want to depending on the style once again i might have a little more dissonance um and a little clustery kind of stuff and it's just you know what i what i did at one point when i was when i was learning i would write out four different voicings of a chord and i'd say can you guys just please play these voicings you know Back then, I didn't have a phone, so I couldn't really, you know, record them. But that's what I do now: I record each one and go home and listen and try to 
decide what do I like, you know, how, which one resonates. And then, that, of course, that gets into what, Lee, what you mentioned a little bit. You got a Wayne Bergeron, probably if it doesn't work, it's not a Wayne problem, it's a me problem, you know. And, and so that's something I've learned with the Big Fat Band. If, if, if they don't play it down the first time and it's not there or the second time, then I better take a look at, at, at the job that I did. Hey, this is, that's a great segue into this question. I have two high school students watching with me who will be writing their first charts. Any advice for beginners? Don't do it. Don't. Play video games instead. I rec you know, you're going to get the big band sickness. You want to get, you want to take that on? I'm telling you. I'm going to keep doing big bands until I spend all the money. That's what I'm going to do because it's a, but there, I'm being facetious because there's nothing like it. There's there's nothing like like the this the sound of that. So what I did, you know, I mean, I had no, I didn't even know what a score was at the time. I I set my first chart. I sat on the floor and I I got a piece of manuscript paper and I wrote alto one and I wrote four bars. And then I got another one. I go alto two and I wrote four bars that kind of matched it. And it was like the, I didn't know you could organize the parts in a score. But I just kind of it was the chart was simple enough. I could kind of keep track of it. But I remember it's on my floor of my of my house. And um, most of us learn how to write music by rolling around on the ground and figuring it out. There's no shortcut. You just have to get, you have to just dig in on it. You can find there's plenty of great arranging books. You know, Don Sebesky's books, great. Sammy Nesco's got a great book, ton of them where you can look and deal with instrument ranges and suggested voicings and you know all that kind of stuff that's the stuff you got to have and you, once you have that fundamentals then you worry about who you are what do you like you know and but it you, you know you need to know all the ranges of the instruments you kind of need to know all the harmonic choices and you know and all that stuff works but obviously we're all on the ladder at some some level you know you just have to start you got to write today and then tomorrow you write some more and the next day you write some more, even if it's like four bars, you have to stay at it consistently. And then before you know it, you got a body of work. Before you know it, you've got like a, you know, you've got some, a skill set. Well, that, that, that leads into this question. When you're writing a full, for a full ensemble, shout. How do you combine saxes with the brass? Are you doubling specific brass parts or is there some independence there? It's a little of both for me. Uh, it, once again, depends on the style, depends on the tempo. A lot of times, if it's a big last chord, like the one there, I didn't do that with the Green Dolphin Street. But sometimes I like to have the trumpets here, trombones here, and sax is kind of like here on the lower grounded part of the voicing. There's some, there's some kind of a woodiness that appeals to me down there. I like the baritone sax on the bottom more than the bass trombone, although if it goes below where the baritone sax can play, below low C, then I'll put the bass trombone down there and, and you know, but uh, th that question is, um, there are some guys that write a little more formulatic in terms of, uh, you know, lead alto double trumpet and down an octave and the second alto doubles trumpet two down an octave and, and it just moves parallel that way. That's an effective sound, if a little bit predictable sometimes. Um, uh, it really depends, on, like on the melody, how high is the trumpet note? If the trumpet note, lead trumpet note is high, then that affects your other decisions about where, where everybody else goes. So, um, I, I'm trying not to be, give an evasive answer, but it, it kind of just depends. Well, I think we'll we'll try to tie this up with just two more questions. Basically, this 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 one is kind of dangerous. The question is, what other contemporary big band writers do you like these days? Uh, I, I like, uh, first of all, I listen to everybody and, and, um, even if I don't, if I, even if it's not a, a style that I'm particularly am attracted to, I want to know what's going on with that. Right. So when I, when I came up, I started off with Count Basie, but then I went to, um, Buddy Rich and Maynard and Stan Kenton and Woody Herman, but then I got into Thad Jones and Mel Lewis and then from there into Duke Ellington and from there, you know, Don Ellis and, um, you know, everybody, I was voracious in terms of listening to everything today. Uh, lately, I really like Christian McBride kind of pisses me off that he just started writing big band charts and came up with that great record of his, you know, uh, I love Maria's work. 
I, there's a guy named Chuck Owen who teaches at the uh, University of South Florida in Tampa. He's a great, brilliant writer. There's there's just so many great writers out there, and um, they all they all kind of influence me still, you know. But I also listen to a lot of classical music, and, and that influences my work, and a lot of pop music too. So um, that's that's it's always been important to me to have a really wide range of influences. Once in a while, I think I hear just a little bit of a Les Hooper flavor in, in a couple of charts too. But um, well, it could be. I played with uh, I played with Les's band back in the day. Oh, yeah, uh, you know these these questions are keep coming in, and our time is is going over. Um, we have we have a couple different people in the room here that want you to come back to the East Coast. One is we hosted your band two years in a row at the Palace Theater in Manchester, New oh, Hampshire. Yeah, I that. Yeah. Uh, New Hampshire. When you're coming to Boston again, and then right after that, uh, when when you're coming back to the East Coast, my best friend and I started the Lakes Region Big Band together because of your inspiration after seeing you in New Hampshire oh, ten so years awesome. ago. That's awesome, man. Here's honestly the thing about the East Coast is, if if they would call us and offer us a gig, we would probably take it. But there's an economic problem because that means you have 20 people you got to fly back there and put in hotels, and that is a conversation stopper again and again. And and I, I you know, uh, so, honestly. It's a lot easier for us to book this band in Europe and in Asia than it is in the United States. We play the Blue Note Tokyo. You know, it costs 95 bucks to get in, to get in. And then you got to buy um, dinner and drinks. Can you imagine that in this country? People going out to hear, hear you know, music and spend over 100 bucks. Not going to happen. There's a different attitude about jazz and about culture in some of these other countries. And so a little bit for us lately, it's been, well, we have these good, better offers. Let's go there, as opposed to calling up. I can tell you how many times we can sell out the Blue Note in Tokyo, but the Blue Note in New York won't touch us. So there are political reasons. There are kind of East Coast versus West Coast related reasons, which is amazes me that's still a thing, but it is. So for me, I'm just kind of going with the flow and, and trying to make good music and play it for people that want to hear it. I, I really wish we could get to the East Coast again soon. It's really been way too long. but. Maybe maybe we need a a campaign amongst the fans to call up the venues and say why haven't you booked a bad band? Maybe I need to organize that. But you know. I, I promise this is the last question, and we're, we'll okay. bring it right back to where it all started. This is I'm a high school jazz student. Any advice for me? Because you are one of the idols of jazz for me. You that's very sweet, and however much of an exaggeration it is, I appreciate it. Um, the advice, the only advice I would say to you, um, Bobby, is it Bobby? Um, find out who you are. That's your main job right now. Find out who you are, find out what you like, and be unafraid of it. Go with it. You know what? I knew I loved big bands, you know, from when I first heard Count Basie, but I didn't start the big fat band until 1999. I was well into my career. And, and, I, and up to that, I didn't know if I knew how to do it. I didn't know if the guys would follow me. I didn't know if I knew how to book a band, how to get an agent, how to get a record deal. So I retreated into commercial music and I worked on films and that kind of thing. And it was great, but it wasn't me. It wasn't me until I got the courage to say, this is who I am. This is what I believe in. If you can find that early in life, that's how, that's how, you, that's how you're happy. If it's a, as a jazz musician, great. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's an educator. Maybe, you know, whatever that is, that's your that's your main uh, goal in life, I think. Well, I really want to thank you for taking the time and doing this just amazing presentation today. Um, it really it sure means a lot to me, and I'm, I'm guessing everybody in the room. You know, we have your recordings. We listen to you, love your charts, and to get a behind the scenes look at how you structure this and make it all work. Uh, that's just priceless. So thank you for that. We're, we're going to um, take it on out here. Just to uh, mention, we're, we're grateful that uh, Make Music has uh, sponsored this along with the other webinar series. If you are going to check us out, just go to smartmusic.com and at smartmusic.com you can sign up for free for a new Smart Music and get going. Check that on out. Uh, on the next slide you can just see what that looks like uh, real quick. And then going forward real quickly, we have training that's available. 
uh, this, if you want to just figure out how to do stuff and start writing, uh, we have e-learning courses at Make Music University. And so we do three levels of finale. We do three levels of classic smart music and three levels of new smart music. All the smart music courses are totally free. So uh, just go to smartmusic.com and get started and uh, look for some more connections with uh, charts. Uh, the, the Gordon Goodwin charts are, are in there. I think there's more on the way and uh, that's all the time we have for now. If you want to take a look at some of this again, it's going to be out in Smart Music. You'll get a link in the email in a couple, three days and uh, then share that with your friends. And here's our upcoming schedule. We've got uh, three more after this. So that's it from, from us. And I think on our last screen, we just give a big shout out to Gordon Goodwin and appreciate it.